I'm Christopher Lighton in Bangalore with India's favorite historian of its 60-year-old modern self. We're in the vaulted living room of Ramachandra Guha, who wrote the giant book on India after Gandhi. Who better to make an educated guess about where India might be going? This is open source from the Watson Institute at Brown University. An American conversation with global attitude, we call it. The short form of Ram Guha's 700-page book is that despite the odds and despite many expert, especially British predictions, India stayed one country, undivided by caste or sect or geography. It stayed various in its culture and its politics, and it stayed a democracy. Other than that, Ram Guha, practically everything changed. You quote an American journalist from the 1950s saying, India means only two things to us Americans, famines and Nehru. In your lifetime, what do you think of as the deepest, most important, most interesting changes? Well, it's, uh, the country is so large and complex, it's impossible to... Uh, to single out one change. Thank you for saying uh, that. But uh, in terms of the West perception of India, I think a fundamental change in my lifetime has been that once upon a time, uh, the West looked upon India with pity and condescension as a place that was going to fall apart, balkanize into many different nations defined by its just different languages and religions, as a country that would face mass scarcity. It, the real, it was the true and original basket case the kind of uh, doomsday scenario of the neo-Malthusians, uh, or as a country that was too poor to be democratic and would come under military rule. So we were treated with pity and condescension, and now we are seen with uh, a mixture of fear and admiration as the place where all the American jobs go to, as a country that's going to take on the world, that with China is going to construct the 21st century as an Asian century. And in my view, both these uh, views uh, have been mistaken. Uh, it was premature in the 1950s and 60s and 70s to see India as going down the tube, as many Western observers did. Uh, it was premature because India at that time had extremely capable and far-sighted leaders who laid the foundation, the institutional, political, moral, and cultural foundations of a multicultural democracy. Uh, and these were leaders who were really quite top class, I mean comparable, shall we say, to the generation uh, of uh, Washington, Jefferson, and so on, the, the American founders. So those predictions of doom in the 50s and 60s under, uh, underestimated the capacity of the Indian political leadership. However, this uh, political leadership has declined precipitously in quality and character over the last 30, 40 years, and hence it's my view that the newer anticipation of, of India's rise to greatness are also premature and flawed because they overestimate the capability of India's political class. Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, they overestimate its ability to uh, bridge the gap between the rich and the poor, to revive our moribund institutions, to stake our claim in a complex multipolar world, and many other things. So India, in my view, will just stumble along in the middle. It's not going to fall apart. It will be a middle-of-the-road democracy with various kinds of conflicts, none of which are going to threaten national unity. Uh, it's going to be beset with inequality. Uh, at the same time, it's an extraordinarily interesting place. I mean, for a historian, uh, there is no place as uh, you know remotely as fascinating as India. In my book, uh, I have used an epigraph from a departing U.S. ambassador, Robert Blackwell, who says, "If I was an intellectual, I would want to be born again and again and again in India." <laughs> so it's a great privilege to live in India as an intellectual. <laughs> One of the sort of middle view which I I think I associate with Amartya Sen that India has rediscovered its essential self. It has recovered from the British occupation of two, three hundred years. It has rediscovered its own 5,000 year history as an accounting civilization in the sense that computing is not exactly brand new and it's not an American or universal import, but that it has found old philosophical roots in an open, argumentative, pluralistic place. And that if it doesn't make it the Asian century, is at least uh, an unusually valuable rising superpower. Well, I have great respect for Martha Sen, and particularly for his work as an economist and a sociologist. I think he's done Im immensely important work in directing attention to gender inequalities. His work on food scarcity and famine is fundamentally important to our understanding of the modern world. 
But uh, with due respect to a very uh, great man, a great thinker and a very good man, he's no historian. Uh, and I think he's, he's, he has a very romantic, rosy-eyed picture of the continuity of Indian civilization. In fact, the creation of a modern democratic republic marks a radical departure from Indian traditions, trends, civil, civilizational attitudes. India, most of India is Hindu. And Hinduism is based on a caste system which is the most sophisticated way of segregating human beings and placing them in different strata, unequal strata. I mean, untouchables were treated virtually like slaves. Uh, there was a great amount of deference and hierarchy in Indian intellectual life. There wasn't the free argument that you find on the streets of India today. India really is a modern creation. There are some aspects of India that continue, you know, our landscape, our temples, our mosques, sure. But the political experiment of a democratic India uh, is the result of patient and hard work of a generation of modern-minded nationalists, uh, several generations of modern-minded nationalists, starting with an extraordinary uh, Bengali liberal named Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who in the early 19th century took on the challenge that Western colonialism posed to us. Say the name again and spell Ra it out. Raja Ram Mohan Roy. Roy. Raja Ram Mohan Roy, he was born in the 1780s and he died in the 1830s. And he was the first Indian liberal. When the British conquered India, uh, Roy recognized that uh, India was, or, or this land was conquered because it, it had become, uh, you know, uh, self-sufficient, complacent, uh, because it, there, was no, there was no completely no innovation, technical or scientific or in, intellectual innovation, because Indians treated their women abominably, because they suppressed their low caste. And Roy took the Western uh, conquest of India as a challenge and an invitation to reform Indian society. He was the first person to campaign for the rights of women, the first person to talk about the need for modern education for young Indian kids, the first person to talk about the importance of a free press. And from Ram Mohan Roy onwards, uh, several generations of reformers, uh, ending really with Mahatma Gandhi, who was the most innovative and far-sighted reformer of them all, who constructed a national community out of very diverse and disparate elements. And you see, before the British came, there was no one India. The territory that we now call India was split into many different chiefdoms and principalities. Even the Mughals at the height of their rule in the 17th and 18th centuries only controlled, controlled about 35% of what is now India. So India was broken up like Europe into many different uh, uh, chiefdoms. The British came and for their own selfish instrumental motives, gave an artificial territorial unity to this subcontinent. And then what Gandhi did was to endow the people of this territory with a moral and political purpose. So that's how it happened. The British united India accidentally. Gandhi gave the people of India uh, a, a shared agenda for political and moral and social emancipation. But hold that point about the British role. Are you giving them an important hand in the creation of this modern... State. Absolutely, absolutely. Because and, uh, this is something which historians must acknowledge, not just because they united India physically, uh, uh, you know, uh, it came under one regime, the Pax Britannica, because they also brought in such instruments of modernity as the English language, a modern legal system, the railways, modern technology. Of course, they had come here, they didn't come here to liberate us, they came here to rule. But it was again, Part of uh, the genius of Gandhi and his close associate Jawaharlal Nehru uh, that they always said we are against British rule, we are not against, we are against imperial rule, we are not against British people. When the British leave, uh, we will take the good things that they gave, gave to us and keep them. And you know, uh, uh, but of course we will run our society not on autocratic lines, uh, but in, in a democratic sense. Now I think the important thing about the Indian national experiment, and uh, you know, we can talk about it as we go along. Uh, what is really is that India is, uh, has innovated a new model or a new template of nationalism. Nationalism in the European model uh, uh, involves allegiance to a single language, a single faith, and a common enemy. To be French means you speak French, you're Catholic, and you hate the British. I think the extraordinary thing about India is that because of the genius and the far-sightedness and the pluralism of people like Gandhi, we are a multilingual country. If you look at the rupee note you're carrying in your pocket, you'll see 17 scripts represented on it, not just Amazing. 17 languages. And we are one nation despite this diversity. Although at birth in 1947, 
Pakistan was carved out of British India and created as a Muslim homeland, Gandhi and Nehru refused to construct India as a Hindu homeland, but gave equal rights to all its all, all, all religious and faith communities. And despite the fact that we were under British rule for 190 years, Indians actually have a very harmonious and equitable relationship with the British. Once the British left, we were equals, and we continue to be equals. We don't have a post-colonial hangover. And I think that's the genius of the Indian political leadership of that time, was that they recognized that the only way to construct a united India was by respecting diversity, not by flattening it out, not by imposing a single uniform model of nationalism. It is an amazing gift, and I, I can't think of hand of another colonial experience that ended so, shall we say, constructively. Absolutely. I wouldn't say ended. That has continued, has persisted so Fair constructively. Enough. I think... the. Uh, uh, if you look at, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Chris. If you look at the relationship between the French and the Algerians, or the Dutch and the Indonesians, or uh, the Americans and you know, maybe the Vietnamese. The Iraqis. Uh, or the Iraqis. Uh, th th these are relationships that are shot through with anger, animosity, feelings of persecution, paranoia, vendetta. But we have a wonderful relationship, and it's beneficial to both parties. Even even the British in Ireland didn't get out as as, as neatly as and, they did and here. And we've continued to have a very good relationship. I mean, if you look at what we've contributed to British culture, just think of English cuisine without the Indian input. I mean, <laughs> can you have a decent meal in London? You can today. You couldn't 40 years ago. Uh, look at the ways in which Indian writers have enriched uh, the English language. We'll come to that. That's an important subject, too. Uh, and, but we have also gained a lot from the British. I think, uh, for example, the game of cricket, which is the, the collective Indian passion we owe to the British, our sense of moderation. You know, I think Gandhi and Nehru, I, I'm emphasizing these two people uh, because they were truly special. Of course, they had uh, very capable, capable associates and lieutenants and, and colleagues who worked with them. But they imbibed the best of the British liberal tradition, which is about accommodation, dialogue, compromise. And that was the way to unite this varied and uh, far-flung population in a common national project. And yet I remember Nehru writing in his Discovery of India that the good English went to the Americas for religious freedom and all other noble aspirations. The, the bad English came to India to exploit, to yes. be beat up and to get rich. Well, but there were also the good English in England. One of the, uh, you know, one of the important aspects of the anti-imperial movement was that a large section of the British people supported this movement. The Labour Party was steadfast in its support to Indian independence from 1906 or 1909 onwards. Uh, you know, you had reactionaries like Churchill who said that I have not become the King's first minister to preside over the liquidation of the British Empire. But you had liberals and, and democrats and socialists who were always for Indian independence. And they included some remarkable English people. For example, the Christian priest Charles Freer Andrews, who was Gandhi's closest friend, who's, you know, who's been immortalized in Richard Attenborough's uh, movie as well, and who played a very crucial role in mediating between the Indian National Congress and the British leaders. So the, there was still the good English in England who was supporting the cause of Indian independence, who recognized the essential injustice of imperial and colonial rule, and the essential justice of the claims of Gandhi and Nehru and the Congress for independence. Hmm. Go back as a matter of history for just one moment to Amartya Sen. He would say that it all began with Ashoka and Akbar, especially the whole notion of an open, argumentative society. Well, he, he, he's quite mistaken. See, as I said, Sen is, a, is not a historian. The roots of in Indian democracy lie in the Indian constitution. The Indian constitution, which was, came into being on the 26th of January 1950, 50, were the, was the result of three years of deliberation by a constituent assembly between 1946 and 1949. The, those deliberations are contained in 13 volumes, yeah. and Akbar is not mentioned once. And you write about the Dalit man who chaired the whole That's thing. Right. Ambedkar, Ambedkar. He doesn't mention Akbar, he doesn't mention Ashoka. It, so I think it's a romantic view. No American has ever heard of the man. I wish you'd give us a, no, give us was, a profile. He was extraordinary. He, was, he came from, the un, from an untouchable family. Let, let's, let me put it this way. 60 years before President Obama became the first African-American uh, to, uh, to achieve the high office of uh, the President of the United States, a man born in an untouchable family wrote the Indian Constitution. Because uh, untouchability is like slavery. You know, it's the same uh, oppressive system of discrimination and persecution. And here was a man born at the bottom of the social heap, B.R. Ambedkar, who by dint of his courage, his commitment, his determination, and his intelligence 
uh, you know, uh, got a PhD in Columbia University, New York, uh, got another PhD from the London School of Economics, came here, back to India, became a famous barrister and public official. Uh, he disagreed with Gandhi on how to challenge the caste system, but because of the generosity and magnanimity of Gandhi's worldview, when India became independent, Ambedkar was asked to be the first law minister, and he drafted the Indian Constitution. And if you look at the Indian Constitution, he and his colleagues drafted, there are no references to Ashoka and Akbar, you know, because they knew that modern problems need modern solutions. Uh, you know, uh, there were 450 years that separated Akbar from the 20th century. There were 2,000 years that separated Ashoka from the 20th century. You know, uh, it's impossible to uh, adapt their models uh, to what is going on here. And even Ashoka, by the way, is a British discovery. The Indians had forgotten about Ashoka <laughs> till a British scholar in the Asiatic Society in the 19th century wrote about him. So I think Sen has a very romantic... Sen is, you know, uh, Sen uh, has a romantic view where he wants to, you know, sort of uh, uh, a romantic and I would even say a romantically patriotic view where he wants to say it all began with the Indians, not with the Greeks, but uh, he's mistaken. I think the real genius of India was how it innovated a new form of nationalism based on the problems it faced in 1947. Should we impose a single language on everyone? Should we construct India as a Hindu state, uh, uh, as a mirror image of Pakistan, which is a Muslim state? And Gandhi and Nehru and Ambedkar decided not to. They also, there were other modern innovations uh, uh, that are incorporated in our constitution. For example, affirmative actions for the low caste and the tribals. To, uh, where again we anticipate what happened, for example, in your country uh, with the civil rights movement, uh, rights for minorities, rights for women. So <clears throat> the Indian political experiment uh, is a modern experiment. It's, that doesn't mean it simply mimicked the Western experiment because the raw material is different. We were much larger, we had, we had been colonized, we were much more diverse. We had to innovate, and adapt, and find our own template, which we seem to have successfully done. And, it, and that template has nothing to do with Ashoka or Akbar or any other emperor of the remote and distant past. What does it have to do with the fact that India was a giant industrial power before the Brits, maybe even an imperial power in, in the East? What does it have to do with the fact that India seems to have a, have a roots in tolerance and openness uh, that we didn't know about until... I don't think India has uh, uh, any, uh, any roots in tolerance and uh, openness. Hinduism is the most oppressive and discriminatory religion uh, that you can think of. You know, we shut off our women. I mean, Islam, both Hindus and Muslims in India have kept our women in seclusion. Uh, we are still so scared uh, to, to challenge our religious figures. You can't blaspheme religious leaders the way you can, shall we say, in the West. So it's not true that we are open and uh, the openness and tolerance is the, was the product of the persuasion and the work of generations of 19th and 20th century Indian reformers from Ram Mohan Roy through Gandhi and beyond. And these reformers had continually to battle against the closed mindedness, the hierarchy, the intolerance, the feudalism that was the bedrock of traditional Indian society. Start from there and introduce a, a, a now vast new establishment of power in India. You celebrate 60 years of democracy, but we also know there are big corporate, unrevealed powers inside that world. Who are the new masters of the new India? Well, I think, um, uh, uh, again, one must have a more nuanced position. I think what happened was... Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, we adopt a, adopted a model of economic development that was based on self-sufficient growth, where the public sector had a crucial role. So there were curves placed on private enterprise, and there were limits on our integration with the global economy. Nehru socialism, in a word. Or Not just Nehru socialism, but it, Nehru uh, subscribed to this socialism, but so did most political parties and economists and intellectuals of that time. And this was seen as uh, necessary because we had to build our industrial base, don't forget that India had been colonized by a, uh, by, a, uh, by a Western multinational company, the East India Company, and hence we were nervous about foreign capital. Mm -hmm. But we probably continued uh, uh, you know, uh, state control of the economy too long. In the 1970s, perhaps we should have liberalized. We liberalized in the 1990s, and this has led to a great surge in economic growth and entrepreneurship and innovation. 
But this surge in entrepreneurship and innovation and creativity and productivity has coincided with the decline in the capacity of public institutions. So um, the state is not able to provide a level playing field. Uh, it's not able to uh, you know, build schools, good schools and hospitals so that all citizens have equal access. So those who start middle class become rich. Those who start working class remain working class. That's been the product of 20 years of economic growth because of the failures of public institutions to provide high quality education and health so that there's a level, level playing field so that there's equality of opportunity for all citizens. So, so I, I wait, wait, linger on that for a moment. Yeah. When you talk about this a decline of the state power, even at the primary education level, and a boom in corporate power, uh, how did that happen? Was that somebody's idea? or no, no, it just happened through a process of attrition and uh, decline of institutions. You know, there's no malign conspiracy at work here. And even it's, I think corporate, there is corporate power, which sometimes plays a, uh, you know, a, a baleful and negative role. But there's also a great deal of entrepreneurial surge and in innovation, including small-scale industries. You know, I think it would be a mistake uh, to uh, romanticize the socialism of the past because public sector industries were extremely inefficient. They were grossly subsidized by the public exchequer. They were energy guzzlers. They polluted the environment. We needed more efficient, capable forms of uh, manufacturing and economic uh, activity, which the private sector could provide. But the state's role would come in uh, in, in ensuring a fairer distribution of the cake. You know, I think it's a mistake to glorify capitalism. It's also a mistake to glorify socialism. I think what India needs is a middle-of-the-road social democracy. And not, not to knock socialism, but what happened to those huge public figures at the center of Indian life? I mean, there are movie stars now, there are billionaires, but the figures of the Nehru scale, not to mention Gandhi, uh, seem to be an eclipse. <clears throat> that's true, but that's true of many uh, uh, democracies. I mean, I, in my book, India After Gandhi, I write, I say... A democracy needs visionaries to found it. And it can be run in mid-career by mediocrities. And then I go on to say that the distance between Abraham Lincoln and George W. Bush, who was then President of the United States, is no greater or no less than the distance between uh, you know, Nehru and, shall we say, the Indian Prime Minister today. So I think, uh, but I think the problem in India today is that we have less than mediocrities. If we had mediocrities, they would be, uh, keep the institutions going. There's a great amount of corruption and criminality in the Indian political system that has, uh, that has increased its presence over the last 30 or 40 years. And that's very disturbing. You know, people of idealism, of integrity, go and, don't go into public life. You know, they go into private life. They become lawyers, they become doctors, they become entrepreneurs, they become human rights activists. But the state itself is peopled by individuals of limited ability and questionable character. And that's very, very worrying. It's very interesting. Give us your own tour of the sort of Indian all-star team as of 2010. Nanda Nilakani is a, is a very big deal in Infosys and in the media. Nobody's bigger in world literature than Salman Rushdie. Introduce us to some of the, the people that the world has to know and know something about. Well, it's very, because we're a billion people. And all kinds of uh, individuals doing interesting and unusual things. I mean, Jawaharlal Nehru, who's been mentioned several times in this conversation, quite uh, naturally, because he's one of the makers of modern India, once said, uh, Nehru once said, that India is home to all that is truly noble, as well as all that is truly disgusting in the human experience. <laughs> uh, so, you know, they are, um, uh, India is home uh, to billionaires who are extremely public spirited, who have given large amounts of their wealth to charity, our own, uh, you know, homegrown Bill Gates and Warren Buffetts, if you will. India is also home to billionaires who are vulgarly exhibitionist, who are building, for, uh, one of whom is building a 400,000 square foot mansion in the heart of Bombay, who gifted his wife a Boeing uh, 747 on her, her birthday. India is home to uh, corrupt and cynical and manipulative politicians, but it's also home to extraordinary selfless social workers, sometimes not very well known even in India. For example, a woman called Ela Bhatt, who lives in the town of Ahmedabad, who runs the Self-Employed Women's Association, uh, which has started cooperatives which employs more than a million women and gives them gainful and dignified employment. 
so India is, has produced Amartya Sen, who is uh, a celebrated Nobel Prize economist and a pioneer, despite uh, what I may have said about his work as a historian, uh, the most, one of the most original and creative economic thinkers in the world today. But India also has third-rate and fourth-rate universities, which produce unemployed and unemployable graduates. So India is a home full of contradictions. And uh, it is, as I said, it, is, it still produces, as in Nehru's day, all that is truly noble and all that is truly disgusting in the human experience. Uh, among, uh, if there was a, uh, it's hard to think of an all-star team, but someone like Nanda Nilekani, uh, the entrepreneur turned public servant you mentioned, would figure in it. He's now joined the government in a, in a very important advisory role. Uh, so would Ela Bhatt, the social worker. So would some environmentalists. Uh, there have been some very important environmental activists in India. A woman called Medha Patkar, who uh, worked ceaselessly, ceaselessly for the rights of people displaced by large dams. I think she should figure uh, you know, in any kind of uh, all-star list. Our writers, uh, who are very many, I mean, there's not just Salman Rusty whom you mentioned, but Vikram Seth, Amitav Ghosh, uh, Kiran Desai, Vikram Chandra, uh, many, many wonderful, and wonderful uh, writers in the English language, also writers in Indian languages. There's one remarkable writer in Bengali called Mahasweta Devi, who is yes. a woman in her 80s. Uh, who has been on the shortlist, uh, the Nobel shortlist several times in the past, who writes novels based uh, on the tribal forest people of West Bengal, and who also has been an activist for the rights of these tribal people. And she's a person of immense courage and dignity. I, I know her personally, and I salute her, uh, her bravery and her physical uh, uh, courage despite her age. She's in her 80s. She still travels all over India in remote parts of India. Uh, so we have uh, lots of exemplary figures uh, in the fields of uh, politics, technology, literature, social work, but we also have uh, a, a rising Maoist insurgency, uh, which is very costly and, uh, you know, uh, which leads to five or ten people being killed every day in the forests of central and eastern India. We do have, as I said, uh, you know, um, uh, extremely uh, uh, callous and insensitive uh, millionaires who, who celebrate their newfound wealth and don't really care about how the other part of India lives. So, you know, we, we are home to all these contradictions. Ram Guha, before we get to the Maoists, I just wanted to ask, who's the most important, most interesting, most rewarding Indian writer that I've not heard of? I, I always resist choosing one name, but since you put me on the spot, I'd say there's a man, India's leading social scientist, sociologist, is a man called Andre Bete, of French extraction, but an Indian citizen, who lives in Delhi. B-E-T-E-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, Andre Bete, and who's written most insightfully about our caste system, uh, our, our varying religious identities, our nurturing and destroying of public institutions. Uh, you know, he's the most, uh, I'd say he's the most incisive commentator in Indian social and public life, and has been over the last 40 or 50 years. Can we talk about the caste system? Certainly. It's, a, it's Martya Sen's line again that India could become part California, part sub-Saharan Africa yeah. forever. And people even in America still think, when they think India, they think caste. If your father drove a bullock cart, you will drive a bullock cart <laughs> uh, for all sorts of irrational reasons. Poverty is enormous and very, very stubborn, even in the new India. What about it? Yeah, it's not only caste. He's, Amartya Sen is right on that, that there is a pol polarity emerging between the India that is uh, between the middle class, which is very large in number, uh, which is self-confident, uh, sometimes aggressive, taking advantages of the new opportunities, and uh, 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 an underclass that is, that is mired in poverty and deprivation and lack of access to schools and hospitals and so on. And part of this is due to do with caste. Part of this is to do with region. The parts of India that are doing well are the south and the west, that are along the coast, uh, that have historically had a, you know, had a, had a uh, experience of trade, uh, that have had more successful anti-caste movements, where low castes have uh, yes. mobilized themselves in, against the high caste, against the Brahmins, and have uh, created much more enduring legacies of social reform. The South and the West also have had historically not been under Muslim rule. And uh, they've also been rice cultures. Now, these two, these two factors are very important. Kerala, for example. Uh, uh, Kerala, Karnataka, uh, uh, and uh, you see, these, these, two, these, two, these, two, these two factors are very important. Where rice is grown, women are much more active in the workforce. Hmm. Uh, 
and this cup and in the south rice was grown in the north wheat was grown and where wheat is grown women only have household tasks they don't participate in productive activity and because they don't participate in productive activity they're not given the respect and that is their due also the north has had a much greater uh, uh, historically, Islam has played a much more important role there, and Islam also emphasizes the seclusion of women in the household. The South and the West, because they escaped the influence of, a of this kind of Islam, and because uh, women always played an important role in agriculture, these are the regions in which women <coughs> are very active and productive. My wife, for example, is an entrepreneur, one of you know, hundreds and thousands in Bangalore. Mm. And I think the South and the West are doing well economically, and the north, the center, and the east are stagnating and even declining. And part of this is now to do with the fact that the uh, north and the east are also home to our richest mineral resources. Yes. And with globalization, uh, many companies have started aggressively moving into these areas where there are large reserves of iron ore and bauxite and dispossessing peasants and tribals of their land creating the conditions for a fertile Maoist insurgency. So part of the inequalities in India are to do with caste. Part are, of them have to do with regional histories. Part of them have to do with colonial histories. In the South and the West, again, the British dealt directly with the peasant proprietor. In the North and the East, the British created a system of landlordism based on the Irish model, so that you had, uh, you know, you, you gave large acres of land to a single landlord. So there was no incentive for the peasant uh, to cultivate his fields productively because he didn't own the fields. So the real uh, inequalities are regional. The south and the west are doing reasonably well. The north and the east are falling behind. Can we talk about the Maoists, the Naxalites, in that northeast and central yeah. India? Arundhati Roy, certainly on the all-star team of Indian writers, told us it's not only a test of India's soul, but that is potentially, and even near at hand, a, a bloodbath. And she pictured it as a kind of India's piece of a kind of universal fight over mineral rights and human rights in the 21st century. Take it apart in terms of uh, the fundamental roots of the, of the fight in precisely those areas over the iron ore and the bauxite, and what is the government doing about it? What is anybody but, but, but the literary class doing about it? Well, I'm not sure the literary class is doing very much, and sometimes they don't help because they po they romanticize the Maoists. Yes. And 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 while 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 the government has been cap has been guilty of uh, uh, collusion with corporate interests, it, before collusion with corporate interests, the government has been guilty of, of neglect of these tribal areas, of not providing, as I've repeatedly said, of not providing good schools and hospitals to these areas, so that the tribals can. Uh, uh, play a, uh, be uh, uh, assured the rights of equal citizenship and then can play a part in the growing Indian economy. And this neglect and condescension uh, towards the tribals of the government over a period of 40 or 50 years has now been compounded by their collusion with corporate interests, which has led to their granting leases of iron ore and bauxite to Indian and foreign companies. And this has led to displacement and suffering and conflict, and it's created a vacuum into which the Maoists have moved in. But it would be a mistake to romanticize the Maoists. The Maoists, uh, uh, you know, Arundhati Roy has a tendency to romanticize the Maoists. Uh, they are savage uh, and, and brutal in their methods. Uh, uh, they are extremely dictatorial. They want to create a one-party state in India on the Chinese model. They are intolerable of all dissent. Uh, they don't really have the concerns of the tribals to heart either. The tribals for them are cannon fodder in a larger war against the Indian state. The fact that the tribals live in upland forest and mountain areas is convenient for the Maoists because the tribals live in parts beautifully suited to guerrilla warfare. After all, Fidel Castro started in the Sierra Madre. You know, that's really the role that the tribals play in the Maoist strategy. The Maoists are as indifferent and as unconcerned about the long-term welfare of the tribals as the Indian state itself. The, they are squeezed. Do we know that? Absolutely. I have, I've traveled in those areas and I've talked to the Maoists. We do know that. They don't romanticize it. And we do know that. I don't and, want to romanticize... And, I, yeah. I, I want to be sure we don't romanticize the violence either. I mean, that has a certain bloody excitement for, for the literary class too. But not for me, I've got to say. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, you know, in those areas, so one tribal told me, he said, he said, he said, it sounds much more evocative in Hindi because this is how it was said in Hindi. When I traveled through those Maoist areas uh, four years ago, he said, 
One side we have the state, one side we have the Maoists, and we are squeezed in, squeezed in between. Another tribal told me that the Maoists use the same tactics of intimidation and terror that the state might. You know, they, when they call a village meeting, for example, they'll stand with their guns. And this tribal said, if the Maoists believed in democracy, they would have the guts to leave their guns outside the village, then come within us and talk about uh, our problems. They don't. They want to recruit the tribals as foot soldiers in their war against the Indian state. And this has escalated violence for the last three or four years. If the Maoists uh, <coughs> had any sense, which I fear they don't, they would enter the democratic process, like the Maoists have done in Nepal, fight elections and become an important political party in the Indian parliament and get their policies accepted and implemented. If the Indian state has any sense, which I also fear they don't, mm. they would uh, activate the provisions in the constitution which allow the tribals to be stakeholders in every mining project, even in corporate hands. Under the provisions of the Indian constitution, there's a schedule called Schedule 5, five which applies exclusively to tribal areas. And in that schedule, if the government decides, it can give tribals up to 50% stake in any mining or industrial project on their lands. So there are ways out of this terrible conflict. But I think people like Arundhati Roy, uh, uh, are, uh, to put it sympathetically, they're romantic about the Maoists. To put it unsympathetically, and perhaps more honestly, they are useful idiots of the Maoists. You know, intellectuals have a history of being wrong about left-wing movements. It, the whole, through the whole of the 20th century, you know, as well as I do, possibly better than I do, how left-wing intellectuals romanticized Mao, romanticized Lenin, romanticized Stalin, romanticized you know, Pol Pot. Pol Pot was romanticized by left-wing intellectuals. They have a, a enchanted with violence. You know, they love this idea of liberation through the gun. Mm. And I'm, fr I'm afraid Arundhati Roy has succumbed to that uh, lure, and uh, uh, it's profoundly unhelpful, because what she has done is that she's polarized the debate. And uh, sensible, rational, thoughtful ways of ending the stalemate now become impossible because either you're for, for the Maoists or against the Maoists. I'm going to send you our interview with Arundhati Roy and I'll send her do. this interview. Do, 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 do. Ram Guha, I'm thinking of all these changes in modern India, but there's one in particular that's not just about India, it's about the relationship with the United States. George W. Bush was probably the most popular American president in India for a very long time. Uh, Manmohan Singh was the most important foreign visitor so far to the Obama White House. India is at least a silent partner with the American war in Afghanistan. What is going on here? And what does the Indian public know or care or judge about this new relationship? Well, look, I think uh, the, the bulk of the Indian public doesn't care about it because you know, they're not really interested in foreign policy issues. They care about but, Afghanistan, surely. Not really. When you say the Indian public, I mean, 95% of India wouldn't know about the war in Afghanistan. Because really? Because they're concerned with their day-to-day -day struggles, you know, with making a livelihood, with putting food on the table. Afghanistan is where India comes from. That's the headwaters, right? Well, not really. We, in, the South, in, in South India, no one comes from Afghanistan. In this, we're talking the city of Bangalore, which is 8 million people, and at least 7.5 million people in this city have never thought, given a minute's thought to Afghanistan. Hmm. because it's very far away and they have other pressing immediate concerns uh, on, on their table. The, for the intellectual class, for the policy making class, for the business elite, uh, there is a debate about our alliance with America. And as in many things in India, uh, uh, this debate is polarized and the press loves to polarize issues. G give, us, give us a short rundown of yeah. that debate. About that debate is essentially about, uh, uh, there's one side which believes and this is general. There is the uh, this is the side associated with some influential editors in in Delhi who are close to the government and with the business elite. They want a very close relationship with America. They want, in effect, a U.S.-India alliance against China. Okay, that's one. And these are the people. And probably Manmohan Singh uh, is more oriented towards that that point of view. However, there's another side to the debate uh, where. In, where intellectuals particularly have been very suspicious about America, uh, partly because uh, they supported pa Pakistan for a very long time, uh, and, and they have a history of not so, uh, supporting democracies. I mean, India has never had cozy relationships with America, even though we were a democracy. 
partly because of fears of what they call American imperialism. And this, is a, this other point of view, articulated by the parliamentary communist parties and by left-wing intellectuals, would want us to resolutely oppose America. Mm. I think there's a middle ground. Again, there's a middle ground. I think uh, we need good relations with America, but not at the cost of subservience. Uh, you know, we don't need to become uh, a junior partner in America's war on terror or America's encircling of China. But at the same time, there are many things that bind our two countries. I mean, we are both great multicultural democracies. Uh, you know, we have historic ties. We now have a big Indian diaspora in America. Uh, we can learn from America. Uh, for example, I think one thing that our business elite can learn from America is your traditions of philanthropy, of giving back to society. Uh, I think uh, at the same time, we should also have good relationships with China, with, uh, with the European Union and Russia. Friendship with America cannot be and must not be at the cost of friendship with China or European Union or anyone else. India today is in the privileged position of having many suitors and of being able to choose them all. So many Indians have said to me in different ways that Indians feel some mysterious but profound affinity with America. It has maybe to do with Thoreau, maybe to do with Martin Luther King to Gandhi to back and forth, but also that Indian immigrants to America today feel instantly at home. They know where they're at. They know how to maneuver. They're global people. They're merchant people. They're adventurous people, maybe even better at it than than Americans have been. What's your take on that link that may be closer than American and French folk or American and Eskimos or Americans and Japanese? No, I think uh, you're right about the Indian diaspora. You see, what is distinctive about the Indian diaspora to America, socially speaking, is that uh, it's middle-class Indians going and becoming middle-class or upper-class Americans. Yes. It's very different from previous waves of immigration to the U.S. In fact, I once wrote jokingly that the Indian immigration to the U.S., is that, that constitutes the first wave of migrants since the Mayflower, who went from being elites in their home country to being elites in their host country. <laughs> so they're a very special kind of migrant, and uh, not to be confused with the Ukrainians or the Jews or the Vietnamese boat people, or you know, and so on and so forth, or the, or the Scandinavians and the other kinds of people you've had, or the, or the, or the Laosians and the Mexicans and so on. So I think, I think the Indian diaspora uh, is, a un, is a unique case, uh, and because of their class origins, they're also extremely instrumental. The Indian di- I have uh, not much sympathy for the Indian diaspora in the aggregate. I mean, I admire some of the individuals. I have friends in the Indian diaspora. But as a collective... They have kicked the stool that took them to the top. They have kicked away the ladder that took them to the top. They have really no interest in India. Unlike the Chinese diaspora, which has given so back to Chinese society. You know, the Chinese, they've invested, they've created institutions, they've uh, uh, got into social work. The so called non resident Indians don't do that? Hardly any. Wow. Because they are completely self interested. They're a professional class, they want to make it in America, which they are extremely adept at doing, as you said. Uh, you know, they are even more successful perhaps than the Jews uh, uh, at the moment, uh, financially. Um, So I think the Indian diaspora is extremely self-interested. Now that India is doing well economically, some of them want to come back. While we were supposedly, you know, a land of famines and scarcity, they had no interest in us. But now that we present business opportunities, um, there's better care for the elderly here than they may be in America. They have suddenly discovered their motherland. You know, this is very different from, shall we say, the Irish or, 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 or the Jews or, or the Chinese who continue to have emotional and cultural and personal ties with their homeland. The Indian diaspora is by and large self-seeking and instrumental. And as I said, there are honorable exceptions, and there are some individuals who have done admirable work. Uh, it may be a break for India, may I say. Immigrants to America have often, including the Irish, been supporters of very reactionary elements back home. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and, and in fact, some of the Indians have also supported uh, right-wing Hindu movements here, for example. Uh, of, you know, in the 1990s, when there, was a, uh, when there was a surge of Hindu fundamentalism in India, and between 1999 and 2004, when there was a right-wing Hindu government in power in New Delhi, you had these kind of irredentist movements, just as the right-wing New York Jews support Israel and so on. But by and large, uh, the Indian diaspora is concerned, has very weak links with its homeland. And I think our relations with America should not be uh, dominated by what the diaspora thinks, but but by our own internal interests. Good point. Good point. I have a double question, Ram Guha, but I'm sure you'll answer it with ease. 
It has to do with values and spiritual values. So many people say to me that in the new India, the old values are gone. Family values, spiritual values, Hindu values, Muslim values, you name it, it's over. At the same time, India has had this very, very powerful role in the world as the home of the gurus, the home of Buddha, the home of a fundamentally spiritual authority. Um, What's your take on the erosion of values, and also what's the future of the guru business? Well, um, on the first question, historically, urbanization and industrialization lead to similar kinds of changes everywhere. You know, the breakdown of the joint family uh, happens uh, in India in the same way as it happened in the, the U.S. and Europe. You know, you, your connection with your grandparents declines because you move far away, you migrate in search of work. Uh, once women enter the workforce, uh, that leads to a different orientation within the household. So in that, in that sense, India is undoing the same kinds of changes that, that the U.S. did or Europe did or other urbanizing and industrializing societies did. And uh, that's inevitable. As a society urbanizes and industrializes, the individual becomes much more important than the family or the community. And some of that is happening here. Uh, and it's because you're disconnected with your village, your family, your community, that you turn to these modern gurus for solace. So the guru business is booming, not just uh, uh, Indian gurus exporting their wares to California, but within India. The guru business is booming. You know, they are, these guys are really, uh, uh, you know, provide some kind of psychological counseling to, uh, you know, hardworking, f frazzled, uh, you know, professionals. It's, uh, it's incredibly lucrative. And there are some uh, genuine gurus who are um, deeply spiritual, like the Buddha was or like Gandhi was. But many of the best and most successful gurus are simply brilliant brand strategists. You know, they're marketing professionals. They've created a, an empire where they market their, you know, their goods and their wares. Uh, and they find a market. And they find consumers. Do you think they still will? I think so. I think so. I think because, again, because the pace of the modern world, you know, you work so hard, you come back, you want some solace. You can't get it anywhere from your grandmother or your grandfather or your uncle. And there's the guru giving you some, you know, uh, well-calibrated and packaged advice on how to harmonize your business life with your personal and spiritual development. You know, in 10 easy steps, you know, chicken soup for your soul, and instead of chicken soup for your soul, masala dosa for your soul, or, 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 or whatever. So I think it's, it's a booming business, and it'll do very well. <laughs> I want to come back to a thing you struck at the beginning. You were, you were dissenting from the notion of an Asian century, but I want, to, I want to tease you with the idea of an Indian century, which keeps suggesting itself to me. India as an extraordinary recovery from colonialism, from imperialism, maybe at its worst, but it's back, it's together, it's itself, it feels like itself. It's also a society that for hundreds, if not thousands of years, has not made a business of imperializing other societies or declaring enemies or dividing the world ideologically. But it's a model, it seems to me, or it could think of itself as a model to Africa, even to Latin America, as a way out of the colonial suffering and the colonial resentment. All of which suggests to me that India has a, has a hugely exemplary global role to play. What about an Indian century? But uh, I would qualify that. India has, uh, it's not, if India has anything to offer the world, it's political and cultural, not economic and technological. Hmm. And this political and cultural offering is based not on ancient spiritual wisdom, but on modern achievements such as the construction of a plural, inclusive, democratic society. And in this respect, we can teach not just Africa and Latin America, but the United States and Northern Europe too. You Americans are paranoid about the invasion of Spanish speakers. Make Spanish an official language and be a bilingual nation. We are a multilingual nation, for God's sake. The Europeans are paranoid about Muslims coming in and how they will handle. Look at how we've handled our Muslim minority. We have 150 million Muslims. You know, uh, four or five years ago, there was a big debate in France mm -hmm. over the headscarf. And the French, who are obsessively secular, banned the headscarf in schools and colleges. You, re you remember that? Sure. Yeah. 
when the debate was going on, I was giving a talk in the University of Calicut in Kerala, which is a Muslim majority district in the southern state of Kerala. In my talk, there were 200 students. There were 80 women in headscarves. And the headscarf was liberating. The headscarf allowed them to go to university. There's a distinction to be made, which the French never made, between the headscarf, which is fine, and the full veil or the burqa, which is not fine, because that is, you know, completely covers you. But the headscarf is, you know, the headscarf is like a turban a Sikh gentleman wears, or a crucifix, or even Indian women, they wear a sari, they cover their head with a sari when it's hot. It's absolutely fine. And because we allow uh, um, our, our different religious minorities to maintain their cultural and, you know, we don't have, as, as one Indian sociologist memorably put it, he said, the Americans follow a melting pot approach. Mm. Ours is a salad bowl approach. Mm. You know, the different uh, uh, cultures retain their ingredients, uh, you know, their smells, their colors, whereas you guys all homogenize it in one melting pot. You know, the American creed, as Samuel Huntington put one, it. One so Big think, Mac. <laughs> one Big Mac, exactly. One Big Mac. And I think, what, so I think that's what India can offer the world, is ways to handle religious, linguistic, uh, uh, and other forms of diversity, including diversities of dress, of culinary traditions, of uh, musical styles. I mean, look at our music. It's actually, look at it. One of the things that unites India is the, is, is the Indian film. Hmm. You know, Bollywood is a great unifier. And Bollywood is a testament to cultural pluralism. You, know, you, know, you, you can have a dance sequence in an Indian film. You know, every Indian film has half a dozen dancers, which some Westerners find peculiar. But you can have a dance sequence which starts with the Bhangra, which is a dance from the Punjab in North India, and which is an early folk dance associated with peasants. So it'll start with that, and it'll seamlessly move into the Bharat Natyam, which is a high classical art associated with temples in South India. And it's fabulous. And we're all completely okay with it, just like our rupee note, which is 17 languages and 17 scripts. So... India is a glorious, remarkable, admittedly flawed, but yet glorious, remarkable experiment in multicultural, multi-religious, multi-ethnic living. That's what we have to teach the world. Or that's what the world can le learn from us and not just... It's not about colonialism. So since it's not about colonialism, it's about living together separately, as someone said. Living together, but following our separate trajectories, our separate orientations, our separate paths, and doing so democratically. The Muslims are a great example. Uh, <coughs> we have 160 million Muslims, and according to one uh, observer, not a single member of Al-Qaeda. Hmm. That might be an exaggeration. There may be five or ten you know, Indian Muslims who have joined Al-Qaeda. But by and large, the Indian Muslims articulate their, uh, their reservations. That they have many reservations. You know, they are poor, they are excluded. But they articulate them through the democratic process. Uh, when there was a the terrible terror attack in Mumbai, uh, in November 2008. I mean, yes. uh, India has suffered some, perhaps more from terrorism than you know, many countries in the West. When there was a terrible terror attack and the terrorists were killed, the Mumbai Muslims refused to bury them because they said these are not Muslims. I mean, what they practice, this cult of terror is not Islamic. So I think likewise with our Christians or our Sikhs, it's, it's a flawed experiment. It's had hurdles, there has been intolerance, there has been discrimination, as there would be because after all we're 60 years young. We are a nation 60 years young, battling against 5,000 years of social prejudice, uh, economic inequality, uh, cultural intolerance, and so on. And it's this modern experiment of trying to create a multicultural, multi-ethnic, democratic political community. Uh, that is what we can export to the world. Oh, that's where the world can look at us. You know, we still have to improve it. We still have to refine it. We still have to live up to our best ideals. But... Uh, contrary to what I have been arguing, most Indians who think that this century will be the Asian century uh, think that this means we'll dominate the West by our technology, our software, our military prowess, so they are m massively enthused about the fact that we have nuclear bombs. That's not what appeals to me. What appeals to me is an experiment in plural and democratic living. It appeals to me too. You make a wonderful case. You're a wonderful advocate. Ram Guha. I can't let you go, though, without asking you, how did you come to be Ram Guha? How do you do it? As an independent intellectual, writing these huge tomes in your own house, outside a university, how, how did you get to be you? Well, uh, 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 I mean, uh, part of it is uh, the extraordinary support I get from my wife. I mean, I'd, I never had to work for a living because my wife is a successful entrepreneur who, who runs a design company, and most Indian 
men have to support uh, their uh, their wife and children. So I just pure luck. Part of it is the fact that I live in the most interesting country in the world. I mean, as a historian, to be born and live in India is to be presented with uh, you know challenges and opportunities that historians in other countries won't. Part of it is to live through these most exciting and tumultuous times. Mm. You know, I'm living through this ongoing experiment of Indian nationhood and democracy. But the independence I prize is not independence from institutional autonomy, but independence from political extremism and dogma. I have my political views. I'm a slightly left-wing liberal, you know, one degree left of center liberal or two degrees left of center. But because India is a democracy, I can articulate my views fearlessly, even though I'm critical of the ruling Congress party for its dynastic politics, for its one family rule. I'm critical of the right wing BJP because I don't believe in religious politics. I'm critical of the communists and I'm also critical of the, uh, of the Naxalites as, 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 as you see I have been, uh, because I believe in essential values, in, in essential democratic and plural values. And when any political party or sect challenges or uh, combats those values, I criticize them. And that to me is real independence. Too many intellectuals identify themselves with partisan political positions. Mm. A real independence is intellectual independence, not institutional independence. Where do you put V.S. Naipaul on that list? V.S. Naipaul is completely independent, but in a, in a kind of a, in a misanthropic way. <laughs> you know, he's brilliant and I admire him really, but V.S. Naipaul only cares for himself. I, I care for my country too, you know. I care for humanity. I think I do. V.S. Naipaul is brilliant and he's genuinely independent. I think the greatness lies in the fact, you're absolutely right, he could not have written the books he did had he been a slave to an intellectual or ideological fashion. So I, I admire his in intellectuals, his independence, but he is fundamentally a much more pessimistic man than I am. I think human beings are capable of redemption, or at least of doing better. He thinks that, uh, you know, human, that this is, he has a, uh, essentially a pessimistic, even tragic view of the world, mm. which uh, I respect, but I don't share. Would you say that his wounded civilization, as he calls India, has healed? No, and I think it will never heal because our experiment is such that it will always be a rocky road. We are so diverse, yet mm. we want to be a single nation. We are so poor, yet we want to be a democracy. We live in an extremely hostile neighborhood. We live in a disturbed world. How could we? We are, we are not Scandinavia, which can be harmonious and peaceful. And, you know, we we'll always have a difficult ride. <laughs> the question is, you know, uh, do, do we, uh, can we live with a few bruises and a few band-aids or do we have to amputate the leg? I mean, that's, so we will always be wounded. That's in the nature of the Indian political experiment. It's in the nature of the Indian political experiment that it will always be conflict-ridden. The question is, are those conflicts uh, manageable or are they going to uh, devour and destroy us? Ram Guha, your line that you live in the most interesting country in the world reminds me, uh, I hope I can say this, of something Ezra Pound said long ago, that if all the music we had in the world was the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, we'd have enough. He said, if all the literature we had in the world was Homer, just the Iliad and the Odyssey, we'd have enough. I often think to myself, if all the people we had in the world were Indians, we'd have enough. <laughs> More than enough. <laughs> <laughs> Ram Guha, it's great to think about the present and the future with a man who is so deeply engaged with the past. It's a huge privilege to sit in your living room here in Bangalore and talk about India after Gandhi, India after today. Thank you enormously for Open Source. Well, thank you. It's been a great privilege talking to you. Paul McCarthy and Ben Mandelkern produced and edited this conversation. It isn't over till listeners add their two bits in comments on our website, radioopensource.org. I'm Christopher Leiden. Thank you for being part of the conversation.